here. Hello, my name is Will Hull, and this will be Unit 2 from Kentucky for Division C for the hearing for the National We the People finals. In a moment, I'll have the judges introduce themselves, followed by the students, and then we will begin the hearing. Students will deliver a four minute prepared statement followed by eight minutes of judges questions. My microphone will be muted during the hearing and I will be holding up a one minute and a time sign uh, to indicate those periods in which the hearing has progressed. I suggest that you use the gallery view in your top right hand corner. Um, so, and at the conclusion of this hearing, the judges will give brief feedback um, to the team and then we will conclude. Um, and the recording has already begun, so I will now let the judges introduce themselves and put myself on mute. Hi, I am Julie Silverbrook. I am the Senior Director of Partnerships and Constitutional Scholar in Residence at iCivics, and I will be serving informally as your Chief Judge uh, this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are uh, in the U.S., and I will have my co-judges uh, Tim and Nicholas, go ahead and introduce themselves. Good morning. My name is Tim Igo. I am a lawyer and a magazine editor at the State Bar of Arizona in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I'm Nicholas Drummond. I'm an assistant professor of political science at Black Hill State University in South Dakota. Great. So our team from Kentucky, do you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves to us? in whatever order you would like. I'm John Vincent. My name is Brayden Becker. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I think, uh, I'm Devin Cassidy. Um, did we lose? Did we lose Ben for a minute here? I think Ben is having some uh, some connection think, issues. Yeah, yeah. Ben's having some issues. Let's give him a minute uh, to get reconnected. Ben, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Ben, can you hear us? Ben Lecky. Great. So uh, what you're all waiting to hear is what question you'll be answering uh, this uh, morning or afternoon. We will be uh, answering question one. Um, I will now read that question and sub questions to you. What were the major disagreements among the 55 delegates during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and how were they resolved? What issues, if any, were not resolved and what were the consequences? What changes, if any, should be made to the Constitution? Um, as Will, uh, our facilitator, indicated, you will have four minutes to answer these questions. You may begin whenever you're ready. Uh, if we could have just a, a second, Mr. Hall, I think Ben is, is still trying to call into the meeting. Sure thing. I haven't started the timer yet. I'll start it when you guys start speaking. Ben, do you need me to give you the phone number and the code? I uh, I just sent it to him. I believe he's working on it right now, um, but uh, we're waiting to waiting to hear back. So we'll be answering question one. And that question is, what were the major disagreements among the 55 delegates during the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and how were they resolved? What issues, if any, were not resolved and what were the consequences? What changes, if any, should be made to the Constitution? You may begin to answer the question whenever you're ready. On February 21st, 1787, the Confederation Congress authorized a convention to be held in Philadelphia for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation and to make alterations adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the Union. The delegates disagreed on where the Union derived its authority, over who that authority should extend, and the extent of the authority that it possessed. While much of the framework was resolved, 
the constitution and its many ambiguities engendered unresolved conflicts that tested its ability to change and at times threatened the union itself. This fundamental disagreement lay over whether revision should preserve the federal character of the articles or whether a new national government was necessary for the exigencies of the time. American historian Jack Rayco wrote that the mood of the federal convention, its tension and even passion also centered on this decision. This debate was resolved in the Great Compromise. From the combination of equal and proportional representation we derived, the peculiar compound of national and federal via the kinetic compromise that we call federalism, according to Michael Zuckert, an American political theorist. One of the most difficult issues, however, was the question of how the states were to be represented in Congress. Robert Yates argued that the bicameral proportional system of the Virginia plan created a strong consolidated union in which the idea of states should be nearly annihilated. Madison argued that the ratification of the constitution by the states made the constitution itself a federal creation. However, as Donald Lutz, a professor of political science and constitutional historian argued, to act upon individuals was to imply the destruction of the community. Cato III argued that without those state communities, the national government would be unable to overcome their dissimilitude of interests, morals, and politics, and would become a house divided against itself. David Brearley of New Jersey thought that the large states will carry everything before them and the small states will be obligated to throw themselves constantly into the scale of some large one in order to have any weight at all. This issue remains unresolved today as the discussion of electoral powers of the people versus the states continues to be debated in regard to the electoral college in Article 2, Section 1 and the arguments of a representation of senators in Amendment 17. Within the context of the Constitution itself, many disagreements were founded on the powers each branch was granted. The unitary executive was opposed by Edmund Randolph, who regarded it as the fetus of a monarchy. Eventually, these issues were resolved into the modern system of checks and balances without which there can be neither liberty nor stability, according to James Wilson, evident in Article 2, Section 1, and Article 1, Section 7. A key issue not resolved at the Constitutional Convention was the issue of slavery itself. While slavery was discussed in relation to representation and ultimately resolved with the Three-Fifths Compromise, the legality of slavery was not. Originally, Thomas Jefferson included the Declaration of Independence that slavery was to be abolished. But in order for the Decla Declaration to be supported by the Southern states, the provision of slavery was removed. Despite its longevity, the Constitution must still be amended and flexible to account for changes in the modern day. The freedoms to speech, press, religion, petition, and assembly should be expressed as rights that cannot be abridged by Congress, any state government, or any institution receiving government funding under the First Amendment. The Fourth Amendment should be expanded to include online communications and data, and as scholar Jeffrey Rosen suggested, the addition of the right to protection from surveillance. While resolving many issues of representation and structure, the Constitution left many future issues to be interpreted and amended by courts, an ability that has shaped the document into what we have today. Thank you, and we are now ready for your questions. Great. Um, I would like to um, ask the first question um, on the issue um, of slavery. Um, you mentioned the three-fifths clause, and I was just wondering if you could cite um, other uh, provisions in the Constitution that address the issue of slavery? Can, can you repeat that? I, I didn't hear you. Yep. I'm sorry. So, uh, beyond the three-fifths clause, what other provisions in the Constitution addressed the issue of slavery? Uh, one, one other um, provision is although they didn't take any definite action to ban slavery, they did say that the slave trade would not be able to continue past 1808, although you know, a stronger foundation for the abolition of slavery only came in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments after the Civil War. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll invite my uh, co-judges to go ahead and pose uh, their first questions as well. 
over. Uh, let me ask uh, your thoughts on the advantages and disadvantages of term limits for members of Congress. I think um, a big advantage is to allow for term limits for a lot of new ideas and uh, people to uh, be be admitted into into Congress. So, like, given get, certain times you could have new ideas such as different representations among like lgbtq and uh, people of color going into congress as people want to see more representation from those groups however if you post term limits into congress it could ultimately undermine the election by having a cap on certain on certain members that could potentially kind of undermine the election and not having full representation of those people another uh, uh, disadvantage that you could see with term limits in the House is also the idea of, well, now, since these members of Congress have this set in stone time of being there, they're going to pass as many of their partisanship ideas and really like make their mark, I guess, for better or for worse, the best way they can, since they know, well, I'm here for a certain amount of years. I'm going to make, you know, as many changes or provisions as I can based on what they believe, which could be dangerous, you know, with the, you know, if they begin to address like certain you know, things that are not, you know, ideal for the country as a whole. I think one um, of the biggest disadvantages of term limits is that it's kind of telling people who to vote for. People may have a candidate that they like and believe who truly represents them and they love the work that they've been doing, but can't continue to have them in office because of a limit. So in some ways it's taking choice away from the people. Um, furthering off of my colleague, Joss, um, it literally takes away the election and makes the election honestly pointless because if the people want their senator or um, house member in office and passing what they believe in, they should have the right to keep them in. Thank you very much. So one of the major points of contention at the convention and certainly thereafter in the newspapers was the appropriate size of a republic. Could you say something about this debate? What were the major disagreements and what side of the debate do you support and why? Uh, well, that that's certainly something that was echoed in Federalist papers like Federalist 10, where Madison argued that a large republic was actually better than a small republic because you'd have you know, representatives of better quality and that system of government could be better administered over a large area. In this case, I think I disagree with with Madison. I think a small republic is better where the constituents or where the representatives are more intimately familiar with their constituents and their desires. Uh, because as Montesquieu, sa Montesquieu said, uh, a representative democracy can't be successful, republic can't be so successful if the representatives are not intimately familiar with what their constituents think. That can only happen in a small republic. Maybe just to follow up, um, there was also Madison's idea about majority factions. Can one of you speak to that? Uh, in, in Madison's, once again, Federalist 10, where he's talking about factions, he argues that a lot of factions is better to keep the system stable and to keep it from becoming, you know, a smaller group of factions that have more control. And that in a larger, in a larger republic, you have more stability uh, among factions. And, and, and could I ask the group, does that analysis hold up even today or just when the nation was founded? I think it, it kind of holds up to today. You see some kind of, I mean, and it's probably directly related to term limits as those who go to Washington and stay in Washington for a long time tend to have these accesses to higher funding for future reelections. And so as the incumbent, they're able to stay there longer. And so they kind of start spacing away from that state that they truly represent. You see some benefits the way they represent the kind of themselves, like with Mitch McConnell having access to some resources now in China and things like that, that a normal U.S. politician really shouldn't have access today. ask a follow-up question uh, in response to uh, the notion that a, um, a smaller republic is uh, potentially more responsive 
uh, to the people. Obviously, the population of the United States has expanded significantly since the founding. Um, do you think that the House of Representatives uh, should uh, be expanded in light of the population expansion? I don't think that the House of Representatives should be expanded in light of ex the expanding population. Along with what I said earlier, I think that the smaller republics are better suited for the intimate concerns of their constituents. So I think the solution there would be to devolve some of that power back to the states, the state governments and the state legislatures, instead of inflating the House of Representatives. Um, you know, back to Federalist 10, again, Madison warned against having a body of representatives that's composed of so many people that it's confusing and chaotic. And I think that instead of expanding the house, if we want you know, people to be more accurately represented, we do that at the state level. I would agree yeah, with uh, my colleague there, Josh, in the sense that like the cap on the house representatives at 435, you know, it's proportionally based off of the population. It's you know, responsive to the people. And, you know, here's, you know, if we keep expanding it, you know, here's to say in 50 years from now, do we just keep expanding it more and more? And, you know, then ideas and, you know, you know, people's concerns of the country, it becomes harder and harder for like those to be passed if there's so many uh, people at that point. I also feel that the only time it would be acceptable to expand the house is when new statehood is added. I feel if you're just keeping it inside the 50 states, then you don't really need to expand the population as you can redraw district lines to have more benefit. And then, um, so with DC statehood, I feel since now would be the only time really acceptable to add members to the house. Great. Uh, so we are at time. Um, so I'm going to invite my uh, fellow judges uh, to share some feedback and I'll share some feedback um, as well. Um, and I, let's see, um, Nicholas, do you want to go ahead and give the first set of feedback? Yeah, sure. I, I very much enjoyed your, your presentation. Um, your opening remarks were excellent. I thought you fielded the questions, the Q&A questions. I did a good job with that as well. Uh, John, you, you seem to know quite a bit about the debate I was looking for. One thing I would have at liked to hear maybe more of was the question of virtue or civic virtue. It wasn't merely that we needed citizens to have this kind of kindred attachment to their representatives, but also one another, that they could then possibly unite and form a defensive concert against elites, if that was ever required. But um, otherwise, I thought you nailed it, so well done. Yeah, I'll echo that. I think you did a really good job uh, in your opening statement. Um, you did a good job answering some tough uh, questions. Um, I think uh, there's a really interesting strain of thought about um, this idea of giving power back to the states. And um, I wish we had more time uh, to talk with you guys a little bit more about your theory uh, behind that. Um, it's not surprising. I've been doing this competition for, uh, co judging this competition for several years. Um, and the number of students who uh, support um, a less strong federal government um, is actually pretty high. Um, so it's not, not surprising to hear that. Um, I would just say, um, just in terms of critical uh, feedback, you did a nice job citing the convention records. I think you struggled a little bit with um, the constitutional text uh, questions themselves. Um, I think you, specifically with uh, the slave trade, um, in addition to the three-fifths uh, compromise. Um, it's possible um, you guys might have looked at your notes uh, potentially uh, during the answer question and answer period, which you're not supposed to do. There's no way for us to know that for sure. Um, but I would just say, you know, moving forward, make sure that during the Q&A period, you are sincerely not looking at your notes uh, because that is one of the rules for the competition. But overall, you guys did a really great job and you should be very proud of yourselves. Well, I will echo that, and I think this is a great start to a day for you and for us, so thank you very much for that. Um, great conversation, well prepared. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll begin with one thing uh, Julie mentioned. I would, when you mentioned uh, devolving some power to the states, I was ready to have an hour conversation about that. So, uh, John, thank you for bringing that up. I would love to have delved more into that, but of course, we only have so much time, don't we? Uh, but I'd love to know what that would look like. Um, when uh, you address the question of term limits, uh, that you did well. 
I, I think it's uh, helpful to think always about what worked then and what works now. And it gives you the opportunity to talk about things like um, what do term, term limits look like? Uh, and you covered it well, but what did they look like in a time when we have maybe a permanent civil service staff, right? Which we didn't have at the beginning. So uh, who's in charge of the government if we have term limits then? Uh, who has the institutional knowledge? That's one thing. And the other interesting fact about term limits or element is the influence of money on elections, right? So what do term limits look like now when incumbents have so much power to get reelected? Uh, does that influence your decision at all? Um, and then finally, you threw in right at the end, brilliant, but I'd love to hear more DC statehood. Uh, that would be a, a fascinating uh, element to de delve into with a little bit more uh, detail. And it sounded like you were ready to do it if we had another eight minutes. But um, I appreciate it, gentlemen. Very well done. Okay. With that, we're going